and then we'll uh, get going on today's work. I'll be changing stuff up just a little bit, um, just because I kind of, we're already doing the test early one section, because I don't want the test to come close to your guys' AP test. Um, and the notes for the next section are pretty long and complicated. So we're actually gonna start the first little bit of it today, just so that we can take a look at that to make the amount of notes that we have to do next week before the test a little bit shorter. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think you guys will really appreciate it because the next section, in my opinion, uh, should be broken up into two sections because of how much stuff is in there. And in fact, when the kids learn these sections in pre-cal, it is broken up into two sections. Uh, so I'm basically going to break it up into two sections for you guys because it's a lot of stuff to try and digest in one big bite. In the meantime, I have a uh, question for y'all. Uh, let's go ahead and pretend that it's the year 2021 and it's the Summer Olympics. Uh, I don't know if y'all know, but the Summer Olympics were delayed a year uh, because of the COVID-19 shutdown. So we have to wait all the way until next year to see Olympic rock climbing for the first time in history. Uh, but let's say that it's the 2021 Summer Olympics and you're in Japan for the summer. So, uh, you know, on top of just going and checking out the games, you also, you know, check out the whole country while you're out there because that's what one does when they travel if you want to get the most uh, experience for your buck, you know. And so you decide to go visit Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji has an elevation of 12,388 feet. And you stay at the nearby town, Shimo Yoshida, which is about 33 miles away, or 175,000 feet. An important part about doing trig is that when you do trig, you need the units to all be the same in order to get the correct answer. So uh, of these two numbers, which one are we going to use? The feet. Um, feet. Yeah, you're going to use the one in feet. And the only reason why I give the other one is that it's hard to imagine uh, 175,000 feet, but it's a lot easier to imagine about 30 miles of distance. So here's my question to you. For you, staying at the hotel, looking at Mount Fuji, what angle of elevation do you have to look at in order to see the summit? How tall is Mount Fuji from where you are standing? Because let's be real, knowing how tall something is doesn't really give you a good feeling of the scale, but knowing how high you have to turn your head to see the top of something that definitely does give you a way good idea of scale, right? Oh, Mr. Robinson, and are the ground points the exact same? So the point where uh, the Mount Fuji hits the ground and the, and the point where he's view, uh, the, he or she is viewing that, is that the oh, exact same? This is a magical distance that I have determined that goes straight through the center of the mountain to the summit. So for the sake of trig, this is the number you want. So that uh, base, okay. So this is without, yeah, this is with the base of the mountain, all, like half the width of the mountain already included. For those of you out there having a hard time imagining this, I'll talk about uh, why that question was asked when I draw the diagram for this scenario. Um, so yeah, figure out the angle of elevation that you would need to view the top of Mount Fuji at. And then past that, I have a couple like uh, random updates before we get into notes for the day. Um, I don't know, we talked about gardening a long, long time ago. Like when this started, I told y'all that I was uh, doing my yearly planting, you know? Uh, gardening is a really good hobby, but I'm just gonna show y'all a quick garden update because my plants are kicking butt. Um, the last time I showed you, my beans were just like little sprouts, but here's where my garden's at now. So my jalapenos, they're basically the same. It's like an adult plant. Look at what my box of beans has become. They've taken over the entire planter and the whole trellis and it's covered in purple flowers and they're gonna start making bean so pods cool. pretty soon. Oh yeah, thanks, yeah. It's also very LA with the uh, palm trees in the background. Um, okay. And then, yes? Do you use compost? Um, so I do use compost and uh, compost is given out for free by the city. So if you look up a map, you can go pick up compost from certain areas around the city for free. Like what the city does is they collect green waste and then they compost it into compost. But compost and soil are not the same. 
Um, compost is meant to be put on as a top layer and it has two functions. Number one, it um, acts as fertilizer because it slowly decays and goes into the soil, which re-enriches it. But the other nice thing that compost does is it holds the water in the soil. It stops it from evaporating quickly. So it's mostly a water saving procedure. Um, this is an avocado tree, or at least a baby one. Uh, this is a Chinese vegetable called bok choy, the one in the back. And it's, it was just a seed and it's already that tall after like two weeks, it's gonna be ready to start harvesting soon. Cause it's one of those plants where you can trim off the outside leaves, but let the plant keep growing. So you don't have to kill it to eat it. Uh, and then that one in front of it is a baby green onion. Uh, the green onions that come from the grocery store, once you cut the top and use them, if you just take the bottom part of it and put it in the dirt, it'll just grow and you'll have infinite green onion. That's a really good like baby's first uh, plant to raise. If you're afraid of killing plants, man, next time somebody cooks with green onions, grab the root off the bottom, put it in a cup of dirt, you'll be amazed. Uh, this is my tomato. Uh, my peas, I think they're starting to die because it's getting too hot, but they're gonna make one more harvest before they're done for the season. And then these extra green beans that I'm growing on the table needed something to climb on. So that table has a little umbrella hole in it. I just like jammed my hiking stick in it and now they're like crawling up the hiking stick. Uh, but yeah, it's a really good garden. Anyway, let's go ahead and begin. So first I'm gonna start off by drawing the diagram so that it's clear um, what it is here that we are calculating and why Alex asked that question earlier about, well, what distance is that? So uh, roughly, here is my diagram. And of course, this is not to scale. So not to scale, this is very much not to scale. Mount Fuji is a wide mountain. This triangle would have to be way wider than the page would allow me to draw it. Or actually, yeah, let's, let me actually draw it so that it's kind of nice here. Um, here's the distance we are away. Here's the height of the mountain more precisely. Yeah, this is a better idea of this triangle. And so this triangle is your line of sight. So you're staying in some nearby town and you wake up at your hotel in the morning and you decide to look out at the mountain and try to look at the very, very tip top of it. And the mountain is over here off in the distance, just doing what a mountain does, being very tall, right? Um, and the question that was asked was about whether or not this includes this. So when I say 175,000 feet, that will always be the easiest to use version of the number being presented. I am somehow getting the distance from where you are staying at the hotel to the bottom center of the mountain so that this makes a perfect right triangle. So this is our 175,000. And then the height of the mountain over here on the other side, the mountain's summit is at 12,388 feet. And so if I wanna know the angle of elevation, which is to say how high do I have to look up to see the uh, tip top of this mountain, what ratio am I going to use? Uh, tangent. Good. So tangent of theta is going to be equal to opposite over adjacent. So 12, 3, 8, 8 foot divided was by. Was 12, 3, 8, 8? I thought it was 5, 5. I did it wrong. Uh, you'll notice that that super tiny change in height, because that's only a difference of 30 feet, it's not going to give you a different answer. It's actually going to give you back the exact same answer. It will be slightly different in the decimals, but the overall degree will be the same. Um, you'll find that this number is not that sensitive to chain, small changes in this number. Uh, and the reason why the units need to be the same, and this is really a technicality, but it's worth knowing now, is that the units actually cancel out when we divide them. So when we do inverse tangent, there's no units in there. Uh, trig functions don't process units. The and number you put in is unitless, the number they give out is unitless. So you gotta make sure that those two units agree. If one is in foot, they're both in feet. Uh, nonetheless, I hit both sides here with inverse tangent. And we get an angle of elevation of what? 4.05. Yeah, I got four degrees. I was, I was checking if I was on radians because I was like, wow, this is, a very, this is a very strange number to get as a degree. But Oh, no, no, that's, that's correct. No, that's correct. So that's actually really tall. So let's talk about what this number means. Uh, but it's going to be hard to imagine what I'm going to talk about because it's really hard to imagine um, 
degrees in terms of like your field of vision, right? So what this means, here's how much space this occupies and what you're looking at. So you're at your hotel looking at this mountain off in the distance, right? Now the horizon, the horizon line, that's gonna be our zero degrees. Right, so this, imagine that this thing that I'm about to sketch here, this is your field of vision. This is what you see when you look out at the landscape, right? Or maybe y'all play video games like first person shooters or whatever, and you've seen the phrase F, oh, I don't know why it's doing that today. Did the video just get dark? Let me see if I can fix it just by having the camera reset. Okay, that's better. Uh, sometimes in video games, you'll see a setting called FOV. Who knows what this stands for? Uh, field something of view. of view, I don't know what that is. Field of view. Yeah, field yeah. Mm -hmm. of view, which is to say how much space is in your visual field. So now, this would be a lot easier to do if we were all in class, but you know, that's been made impossible by a viral outbreak of some renown. So everybody follow along with me. We're going to look at the boundaries here of our field of view. So put your hands out in front of your face, right? And notice that you can't see everything. Oh, oh, oh my mic's working. Okay. Uh, put your hands in front of your face to test out your left-right field of view. So go ahead and move your hands outwards until you cannot see them anymore. So I'm moving my hands out until I cannot see them. So for me, that's about here. Right here, I lose my ability to see my hands while I'm looking straight forward. Now, for this to work, you have to keep your eyes straight forward because now you're using your peripheral vision. Of course, I can see my hand if I turn my head or if I turn my eyes, but my hands go about to here, right? So based on that information, we can tell that from the top down, we have some limited field of view. So here are your eyeballs, here's your head, right? And this is top down. Boy, that's a horrifying sketch of, of human vision. And so you can see out along an angular line here, that's your left, right field of view. And for most people, this angle here uh, is about, yeah, it's about right. You have about 100 degrees. So left, right, you have about 50 degrees of vision. Is that first part okay? Wait, is that including yeah. peripheral vision? Is that including what? Peripheral vision. Yeah, so your peripheral vision extends approximately from on center, 50 degrees to the right, and then 50 degrees to the left. Anything past that, you wouldn't be able to see it out to your side. Now, it's, the world, yes. When I do that, like, I could take it further, but like, you know how like you could see things like on the side of your eye, but you don't really like notice them? Yeah, that's called your peripheral vision, uh-huh. Because I was gonna say, I could have looked further. Uh, yeah, 50 degrees is just a rough estimate. And one interesting thing is that uh, peripheral vision amounts are very, very different depending on like your brain or your skull structure or whatever. Uh, and you can see that really obviously in like the animal kingdom. So if you look at like animals which are hunted like deer, what do you notice about that thing's eyes? It's on like two sides of the face. Yeah. Yeah. Like so how much peripheral, like if we have 100 degrees of peripheral vision, like we see outwards in a cone of about 100 degrees of width, what they do you think like peripheral vision is on a deer? They have a lot. 270 or like maybe one, 200. Yo, 270 is actually a really good guess. So 180 would mean that you see everything out to the left and right. Yo, their eyes are on the sides of their freaking heads looking outwards. They probably have like 200, yeah, 270 degrees is a good bet. That if you consider a whole circle, they can see more than half of what's going on around them because they need a spot for what? What are they actually looking for? Predators. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then if you look at a predator's eyes, so let's say lion eyes, uh, predators, what do you notice about their eyes? Like our eyes. It's in, it's it's so the sun from bothering it. It's straight. It's partially that, but yeah, I'm talking about the direction. They're both straightforward because they need a very narrow direction of vision so that they can focus in on what they are hunting and not notice what's going on around them, because for the most part, they can't really be threatened by anything that's not another lion. So then, uh, we're not predators. Why are our eyes so narrow? We are. We are predators, dear. Yeah. Oh. Um, and I mean, I'm not even talking about like 
what we are now that we've invented swords and guns and humans used to do before we were like hunter gather i'm sorry the hunting strategy that we did when we were in the hunting gathering phase of humanity is we would just run animals to death we are the most powerful long distance running animal in the world which is why humans run marathons for fun and we run ultra marathons for fun before we invented projectile weapons the way that we would kill um game on the plains of africa is you just chase them for eight hours and no matter what the animal is at the end of eight hours we'll still be running and they will be completely exhausted so you can just walk up to it kill it and then take its carcass back to the village um yeah we are a predator it's just that we don't take our prey down by biting it in the neck with our teeth because our teeth aren't very sharp but we just chase them until they die of exhaustion it's kind of terrifying when you think about it um nonetheless 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 back to this field of view stuff before we got tangented off you can also see that you have an up down field of view so put your hands in front of your face and look straight forward and spread your hands up and down until uh your hands are gone and I would argue, I think it's pretty clear that um, this field of view is smaller than the left-right one. Like left and right, you can really get your hands out there for whatever reason, but up and down, your hands leave your field of view way quicker. Yeah, because isn't your like, forehead higher than your like eye socket? It's a little bit of that. It's also the fact that your eyes are positioned left and right and not up and down. If your eyes were positioned like this up and down, you would have a bigger up-down field of view than you would left and right. But this is also why all of our screens that we're looking at, like if you're at a laptop, that's why our screens are proportioned this way, because 16 by 9 as a ratio is actually pretty close to the same ratio of what our field of vision is. Um, and so up and down, we have a little bit less than 50 degrees. We have about 40 degrees of vision up and down. So from the horizon line, you look upwards 40 degrees. You also look downwards 40 degrees. So how should we interpret the fact that this mountain, Mount Fuji, if we're this far away from it, will appear as an uh, angle of elevation of four degrees? How much of our field of vision does that take up? Like barely anything? No. It's going to take up our entire field of vision. It's going to take up quite a chunk of it. And here's how to think about it. The horizon is at zero. Looking upwards from the horizon, you have about 40 degrees, maybe a little less, 35. Downwards, you have 40 degrees, maybe a little less. Four degrees, what fraction is that out of 40? 10% of your vision. Yeah, it's 10% of the height of your field of vision. So it would appear here, whereas, of course, things that are closer to you, right, where this ratio is about one-tenth, where things that appear closer to you, of course, they'll be bigger. But, yo, you're 30 miles away from this thing, and it's a tenth of your field of vision up from the horizon. Uh, yeah, all, I, all I mean by this is to put these types of numbers into context. To think about how big it would look, you have to think about how big your field of vision is. Are there any animals who have like a higher field of vision? I mean, field of view? Uh, yeah, prey, prey have the highest uh, field of vision. Because again, like I said, the more likely you are to be... Um, like a horse? Yeah. Horses straight up have their eyes on the left and the right side of their skull because they're constantly scanning for prey. I don't know what would win, but I'm going to go ahead and guess it's probably some kind of goat. <laughs> Are pterodactyls like that? Uh, I have no idea about the fine detail about the skull shape of pterodactyls. Uh, fish are also a really good look at an animal that has a very, very, very wide field of vision. Because their like, like eyes are on the complete side of their heads. Yeah. Is that what about why like cats plant? on the front? Huh? Is that why dogs and cats are on the front because they're predators? Uh, yeah, that's why dogs and cats both look forward because for the most part they're predators. Dogs, again, like this is a thing where like if they're straight forward, they're predators. If they're straight out, they're prey. But if you're doing stuff in between, you kind of get eyes that are somewhere in between, um, which is why dogs, they do a little bit of hunting and gathering, which is why their eyes have drifted away from how they were when they were pure uh, wolves. Uh, Biology is weird, man. It's so strange. Anyway, uh, I said today would be workshop for the section, and that's kind of true, but I also kind of lied. Um, today we're going to do notes, and I'm going to do a little bit of outline on the... Uh, next section. I'm going to talk about what it is we're doing next week. 
We're gonna start those notes today because like I said, those notes are involved. So for the next section, um, let me outline it and then we'll do the first derivation, but we're not gonna do any examples uh, or nothing too involved. I don't wanna eat up the whole hour. Uh, but next week, the next section, 8.6, it's called the law of sines and the law of cosines. Now in pre-cal, uh, in the book that we use, uh, these are laid out as two individual sections because there is a lot of stuff going on here. This stuff is not easy. So it's really wild to me that this book makes it into one, which is why we're gonna draw a line in the sand today. And today we're gonna do the notes for the law of sines so that next week we only have to worry about learning the law of cosines before the chapter test. Uh, now, here's what the main thrust of this is. What is the one rule about using trig? What kind of triangles does it work on? You usually write triangles. Right to triangles. That's the trick. So Sokotoa plus the Pythagorean theorem, they are amazingly powerful tools because they allow us to solve out any right triangle where we have one side and an angle or two sides. Under either one of those conditions, you can start from that initial information and you can build out the rest of the triangle. Well, here's a little bit of vocab that we need to understand what we're talking about today. An oblique triangle is by definition, this is a definition of exception, any triangle which is not right. So this is to say every single triangle out there in the world where angle A isn't 90 and angle B is not 90 and angle C is also not 90. So none of the angles inside of the triangle can be 90 degrees precisely. And if it falls into this category, then it is an oblique triangle. So this is actually describing most triangle, right? Uh, however, the power of the law of sines and the law of cosines, the reason why they exist, and excuse me, I'm going to abbreviate it down like this uh, for the rest of the notes, just because writing this out every time kind of sucks. So LOS, law of sines, and L-O-C, law of cosines, here's what they are going to give us the ability to do. The law of sines and the law of cosines allows us to do trigonometry with oblique triangles. So if you are ever asked to do trigonometry and you're like, uh-oh, this isn't a right triangle, Ding, 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 ding. Red lights should go off in your head that tell you immediately, I need to Google the law of sines and or the law of cosines to get a quick refresher on what this problem is actually talking about. Uh, is that first part okay in terms of our motivation? And I know the camera got dark again. I don't know why that's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so all I want to do today, because next week we can talk all about um, the what and the how, but today I just want to start off with a simple uh, derivation of the law of sines. So here's how we derive the law of sines. Now, the reason why I'm titling this derive the law of sines is that I don't want any of you to be confused. What I'm about to do is not how we solve a law of sines problem. What is a derivation? What is that? Where something comes from. How do you, like, exactly. All that I'm gonna do here is we are going to show where the law of sines comes from, but the only part of it that you actually use is the final statement. Now to derive the law of sines, let me go ahead and start off by drawing an oblique triangle. And by tradition, I'm going to name the angles A, B, C, A, B, C. And so what side length is this? Um, A. Little or, B. Yeah, little B. And this is? Little A. Oh boy, that's my rap name. And then what's this? <laughs> little C. Okay. Uh, I guess I should make it more clear that that's capital. Yeah, keep in mind, capital letters are angles, lowercase letters are sides. Why? No good reason. Some dead white dude from the 1800s decided it should be that way forever, and we all just agreed. Nonetheless, 
Uh, what I'm going to do here in order to derive the law of sines is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add in the intermediary altitude, h. And know that h is not a feature of this triangle, so h should not appear in the final answer. Here's how we derive the law of sines. Let's go ahead and start off by taking sine of a. According to the rules of Soka Toa, what is sine of angle A? Opposite over hypotenuse. So from here, let's go to the opposite side. What's opposite of uh, A? Lowercase a over c. That is not opposite. What is opposite e? of angle A? A. Yeah, no, no. Lowercase. Trig only works with right H. triangles. So H. opposite from here is H. H. Oh. Then divided by the hypotenuse. C. C. Step one is complete. Step two, I also need sine of angle C. So sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. What's opposite from here? H, H. over A. Divided by the hypotenuse, which for this right hand right triangle, that's A. And like I said, H is not actually part of this triangle. It's inside the triangle. So that doesn't interest me. We're going to get rid of that. And whenever we're doing algebra and we want to get rid of something, we're going to substitute against it. So I'm going to solve this equation for H, multiply both sides by C. So C sine A is equal to lowercase h. And then over here on the right, I'm going to also solve it for h, then multiply both sides by a. a sine c is equal to h. And what's that called when a is equal to b and b is equal to c, so a is equal to c? Uh, the law of to the t. It's yeah, because, third, because the t. third angle? No, trans. Something like Translation? Transver no. Transversal? Law of transversals? No. Oh, glad we reviewed it because this is used a lot in math. So if you have A is equal to B and B is equal to C, so therefore A is equal to C, this notion is called the transitive property. So here I'm going to employ the transitive property. If this is equal to H, right, this relationship will give me that height. And this relationship is also h. It will also give me that height. What can I do with these two equations? Set um, them equal to each other. Set them equal to each other, yeah. So we get this beautifully symmetric trig object. C sine a is equal to a sine c. This is the fundamental version of the law of sines, but you'll always see it written a certain way. I'm going to write it that way for y'all. Um, just because it's the way that you'll almost always see it written. This next step, it's hard to see why I would do it, but you'll see it once you see the answer, which is true of a lot of higher end math. I'm now gonna divide both sides by AC. I'm gonna divide both sides by AC. What cancels on the left? The C. What cancels on the right? The A. So this is to say that sine A over A is equal to sine C over C. And if we were to feel fancy, we could go back to our original triangle and we could actually add another altitude. If you added one more altitude, so for example, I could add in uh, this altitude, then adding in this other altitude right here, would allow us to relate a third ratio and take a wild guess, just follow the pattern. What do you think that third ratio would be? Sine B over B. The law of sines would also state that sine B divided by length B would also hold for anything going on in here. This right here is our oh so useful law of sines. Are there any questions up through here? Yeah, uh, I had a question. Why were we dividing by AC? Like a lot of things in math, it's because I know what the answer is. And the more math you do, the more that you'll be able to see steps like that. It is really for no reason other than the fact that it takes us from something where the terms are mixed to something where the terms are isolated. 
this is definitely one of those steps in math where the only reason I know to do it is the fact that I've done this derivation every year for the last 10 years of my life. This is one of those like sacred facts that you memorize that like, oh, the key to this equation is multiplying by AC for some reason. Well, is that just reducing or does it complete, is that just simplifying or does it completely change the answer? It's no, it doesn't change the answer at all. And that's one of the most important things to take away about algebra. As long as I do the same thing to both sides and I make no mistakes, it never changes the answer. I could take an equation, any equation exists in the world, and I could add four to both sides and that new equation is still true. Because I am choosing to divide both sides by the same thing, I'm choosing to divide both sides by AC. It can't change the original relationship. It's just gonna make it look different. But trust me, you'll see when we do the next question that this is obviously way more useful. Okay. Very good. Um, and so it's hard to see how we would use this equation. So I'm just gonna lay it out cleanly for you. There is one amazing use case for this. This is useful when we need to do trig, right? What kind of triangle do these two laws work on? What kinds of triangles, y'all? Oblique. We need to do yeah. trig on an oblique triangle. And at the end of this chapter, we'll actually make a flow chart of like, hey, what method do I use, where, and why? So if you need to do trig on an oblique triangle, that's the first sign that you need to use either the law of sines or the law of cosines. And you know that specifically it is a, God, why does the, the lighting in here isn't changing? And all my settings are the same as they always are. I don't know why the camera keeps dipping. We need to do trig on an oblique triangle. And here's the big and. We are given a side angle pair. You must be given a side and angle pair. That is to say, in order to use this, you either need the combination of side A and angle A, or you need the combination of side B and angle B, or you need the combination of side C and angle C in order for this to be useful. If you have any other set of data, either three sides or three angles, or none of the sides and angles that you're given pair off, then you know you need to revert to the method we'll learn next week, which is called the law of cosines. We're now going to do a law of sines question, just one example, so I can strike while the iron's hot. I want you to see how this equation is manipulated. And then after that, uh, we'll have a workshop for the remainder of time, which will probably be about 15, 20 minutes for y'all to ask questions uh, before the weekend. Is that okay? Yes. Very good. And so let's say that the following request is to, well, please complete the triangle. And uh, we're going to round everything to the nearest hundredth. We always use hundredth in high school for whatever reason. I don't know why that's like the standard of chemistry. It's just a nice way to write decimals because then it ends up looking like money, right? Uh, and so let's go ahead and say at the outset, here is our triangle. And uh, our measurements are as follows. All that we know to start off is this one angle right here. This one angle right here at the start is about uh, 23 degrees. And I'm gonna choose uh, L, M, and N. And on top of that, I'm also going to assign a value. Uh, we're gonna start off with this medium length right here. That's close enough to five. And in order for this problem to be workable at all with the law of sines, we are going to need what side length? To use the law of sines, we need a certain type of initial information. We need an opposite side and angle pair. So if I have this angle, what side do I need for the law of sines to work out? The, the hypotenuse, no, sorry, the altitude from M. The, the law of sines, and I mentioned this at the top, 
blob science has nothing to do with that altitude. That's where yeah. the equation comes from, but at no point will we actually know what that altitude is. It's just an intermediary variable. For the law of science to work, you need the side angle pair. So for the law of science to work, we need this side. The other side would not be helpful to us in solving for the answer. So here's what the deal is. I'm gonna tell you that this is a side length of three. And believe it or not, this is sufficient information in order to solve for all unknown values. So just to make sure we're on the same page, this is angle L, which means three must be side length L. This is N, which means that this must be side length N, and we're missing angle M, and we're missing side length M. So a complete answer in terms of solving the triangle means that we need to solve for angle N, side M, and angle M. We're given three numbers. We need to use those three numbers to solve for three more numbers. And here's how we're going to do that. The first thing that we're going to solve for must be angle N. It is the one thing that we have information about, right? I have L and L. That'll let me set up one ratio. I have N right here, which will let me solve for N down here. So what is the law of sines? What do I write? Sine of? 23. We're going to do this with variables. So okay. sine of L over L. And uh, this must be equal to sine of N over N. That is the law of sines. And of the four variables that are here, I have three of them, right? Which three do I have? Two oh. sides and the L. I have L, I have L, I have N. So we're actually solving this for capital N. Let's go ahead and do that first. How do I get capital N alone? Multiply both sides by N. I'm going to multiply both sides by lowercase n. And this is true whenever you're working with advanced equations. Do the algebra first before you plug the numbers in. It's always a better look. So on the right-hand side, those cancel out, and now I have the equation that sine of n is equal to n sine angle L divided by side L. And now how do I get angle n alone? How do I undo sine? Inverse it. Now I'm going to hit both sides with inverse sine. So this is telling us angle n is equal to inverse sine of n sine l divided by l. Are there any questions up through there? No. No? So now that we've solved for our variable successfully, the rest is substitution. So just plug it in. This is asking us to do inverse sine of n, which is 5, multiplied by sine of L, which is 23, divided by length L, which is three. And if we feed this to our calculator, this will tell us what angle N is. This is how we have to do trig for oblique triangles. Regular SOHCAHTOA doesn't work in this case because we don't know that uh, whether or not this is a right triangle. If you don't know whether or not it's a right triangle, it's a law of sines or a law of cosines question. So, inverse sine, 5 sine, 23. Then divide that by 3. And then I'm going to close the parentheses. And notice all of this junk is on the inside of the inverse sine. Depending on how your calculator works, you might have to calculate this out first and set that aside and then plug it into inverse sine. But in the end, the answer you get should be 40.64 degrees. Angle N is equal to 40.64 degrees. Mr. Robinson, I got 0.65. Uh, it was somehow entered in your calculator wrong. Double check the way that you entered it. Okay. Okay, so let me go ahead and go back to my diagram and then we'll be very, very, very close to solving this problem. N is uh, 40. 0.64 degrees. We just learned that this is one of our answers. 
So now that I've done that, uh, how can I complete the triangle? Third angle theorem yeah. for angle M. Number one. Minus 40.64. No, that's not, that doesn't work. This isn't a right triangle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so angle it should, M it must be equal to? Yeah. 116.36. 180 minus the sum of the other two. The third angle theorem tells us that all three angles of a triangle have to add up to 180. The 90 degree trick only works for what kind of triangle? Right triangle. Very good. And so angle M here is going to be equal to uh, an obtuse angle because those other two are pretty small. So uh, I believe I heard that it'll give us 116 out there? Yeah. 116.36 degrees. So there's the second part of our answer. So this is 116.36 degrees. That is also gonna get a highlighter mark just to show that that was not there when we started. That's part of our answer. I'm only putting it on the diagram so that it's easier to imagine how it is that we're gonna get the last bit of our answer. So what's the only piece that we're missing? Side M. Side length M, and how do you think we're gonna calculate it? The law of sines. We're gonna Because we can't use like Pythagorean theorem or anything like that. Correct. Pythagorean theorem does not work on oblique triangles. It only works on right triangles. So to get this final length, I'm going to say sine m over m is equal to, uh, what information were we given at the start? L, angle L, and then side L. Yeah, and so for no particular reason, I'm going to use sine L over L. If you at home wanted to do this with sine N over N, you would get the exact same answer. That's fine. And of these four variables, I have these three. So which one are we solving for? Lowercase M. Lowercase M. So to get M alone, I'm going to do a little bit of algebras. Uh, I'm going to start off by multiplying both sides by ML. Uh, now, the nice thing that this will do for us is it's going to get m out of the denominator. I don't want it in the denominator if I'm solving for it. So by multiplying both sides of this equation by ml, m and m cancel, l and l cancel. So now I'm back to that uglier version of this equation that we had before. l sine m is equal to m sine l. And now how do I get lowercase m alone? Divide by sine uppercase L. Very good. So lowercase m is going to be equal to L sine m. And then to get this lowercase m alone, I'm going to divide the sine L over to the other side. I'm also swapping the sides of the equation in this same step so that the solution is cleaner. So this is telling us that side length m must be equal to side length L multiplied by this sign, then divided by this sign. And now we'll go ahead and plug in the numbers where L was three, angle M was 116.36, divided by sine of angle L, where L was 23 degrees. And again, this is all just numbers, so from here we feed it to our calculator. So three sine 116.36, divided by sine of 23, And this gives us a length of uh, 6.88. So here's what the law of sines allows us to do. The law of sines lets us solve for sides or angles. It's just algebra once you set up the relationship. And it makes it so that not only can we do trig with right triangles, we now have the ability to also do trig with oblique triangles given certain information. We were able to show that based on these first three numbers, a length of five, a length of three, and an angle of 23, from that, we were able to calculate our first angle, 40.64. From that angle, we were able to calculate this other angle, 116.36. And from this angle, we were able to calculate this length, 6.88. Now, we can't use the Pythagorean theorem in order to check, but we can use the triangle inequality. Who remembers the triangle inequality from two chapters ago? Simply put, the triangle inequality tells us that the largest length is opposite the largest angle. 
and the smallest side is opposite the smallest, smallest angle. And that makes good sense because the sides of a triangle, right? If this is your angle, it's going to go out and it's going to intercept a short side. But if your angle is big, it's going to go out and it's going to intercept a big side. An easy way to check to make sure you probably did it right is that when you're done, little side, little angle, medium side, medium angle, big angle, big side. Perfect. Uh, are there questions on this technique? Nope. No? Okay. So, like I mentioned, uh, Law of Signs homework will not go out today. I just didn't want to, uh, you know, procrastinate on these notes. Um, so next week on Monday, we're going to have the notes for the Law of Cosines, which is also a fancier technique. And then we're just going to have as much time as I can allow for us to practice. You'll have two homework assignments for signs and, or Laws of Signs and Cosines, one from the book and then one that I've prepared for you. Um, and then all of that will be to ramp up for the chapter test next Friday. I'm going to try and get your guys' or quizzes graded and entered as soon as possible, either today or tomorrow, just because I need that stuff done and out of the way, because next week I have uh, my own test to worry about. Are there any questions from the current homework assignment that's live and out there, the one about angles of elevation and angles of depression? No, but I'm done, so can I go? I did it yesterday. Yes, if you are done and you have it uploaded, you may absolutely head out and start your Friday a whole uh, eight minutes early. See you, Mr. Robinson. Okay, see you, Mr. Robinson. Peace, y'all, peace. If y'all have any questions, just holler at me and I'd be glad to work them out on stream before the end of the period in a few minutes. So if you have any homework questions, just holler at me and I'll do them here. Sorry, I lagged out. Mr. Robinson? Yep. I have a question on the homework for number eight on the second set that you posted. Uh, okay, let me pull that up. Oh, heck, I deleted the PDF off of my computer. Give me one second. I got to pull it up in my second screen on my desktop. Okay. Uh, AGBOMHS, 2020, teacher resources, geometry, Glencoe geometry, right triangles and trig, angles of elevation and depression. And I believe it's page 32A? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about question eight? I, um, I don't understand how to, I don't know how to solve for what it wants us to solve for. Like, um, let me pull it up too. I oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. So here's the deal. And it, I guess this is kind of my fault for like sparing you guys the hard maths of this. When you do this angle of elevation and angle of depression stuff, you're actually measuring from your own eyeballs, not from the ground. So uh, myself, I'm about six feet tall. So it's about like five be nine inches to my eyeballs, right? Okay. So if I do an angle of elevation calculation for myself and I'm like, oh, that tree is 30 feet tall, what I'm actually measuring is that tree is 30 feet tall from my eyeballs. So that means the tree is actually about 35 or 36 feet tall because you have to include your own height. So um, luckily here, they uh, draw the diagram for you. Um, so the whole point in saying that his eye level is three feet above the pier is that the height that you want to use is actually 33. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the triangle that you're solving here in question number eight on page 32, like with all of the context of the word problem removed or whatever, uh, is we have a right triangle where you're looking for this. This is going to be the distance from the person to the whale that they're seeing. Uh, and that this is 33, 
and that the angle of depression is 20 degrees. So here is 20 degrees. So what angle should you actually do trig with? The the inner angle from 20 degrees, so 70. Yeah. Very good. So if this is 20 and these are complementary because they make a right angle, then this homie's got to be 70. And so from the 70 degree angles perspective, what is this side called? Opposite. And we have the? Adjacent, so it's so 10. Very good. So tan of 70 is going to be equal to L over 33, and then solve for L. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Man, I'm just so glad somebody actually had a question. It's so rare that I actually get to help with the homework anymore. <laughs> oh, plus it also, oh, by the way, everybody knows that they should upload their class for free because it's uh, Friday. I, I very much miss, um, being able to just check everybody's classwork in class. It was way easier when I could just like walk around and eyeball all of them. I'm so sad now that's a thing that gets turned in that I actually have to flip through on Google Classroom to make sure everybody's keeping up with it. Okay, uh, the time is about 30 after, so like I said, be sure to get that classwork in. Um, if you have any questions about the homework, reach out over the weekend in the form of an email, or I could take those questions on Monday. Uh, next week on Monday, we'll be going over the law of cosines, and then we'll spend the next three days uh, working on a bunch of mixed practice on the law of sines and the law of cosines. 
in order to get ready for the chapter test at the end of next week. You all have a very nice weekend, and I will see you all on Monday. You too. Bye, Mr. Robinson. Peace out, y'all.